Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And is it is it a, at this point in time, is it something where like the when like a rancher kind of reaches out for that sort of a setup, they've already gotten into the regenerative process and their their farm is or the ranch is already kind of in that position? Or is this kind of like, or is there a, a side of it where okay, you have a traditional ranch, you want to convert it to a regenerative so you can take advantage of this type of a setup. Is that a piece of the puzzle that you're including too? Or is that still something that uh, the, the rancher kind of has to figure out or decide to take that leap on their own? No, no. And, and, and I think that's really one of the challenges and the opportunities within the regenerative space, right? Now let's look at organic as kind of that, that, alt, that other model is if you want to become an organic certified USDA, you know, organic certified person, you can't have any pesticides, any of those, you know, negative inputs for three years. So you have to go through that cost differential of, you know, going commodity to organic and cover that cost for three years before you're able to ultimately uh, manifest the economic benefit of that. Regenerative is quite a bit different. We are meeting these producers right where they're at. Like if you tell me you want to, you know, you want to become regenerative, our teams are going to go out there. We're going to work with you. We're going to help you kind of devise these plans. We're going to put you on a path to being fully regenerative, but recognize that the effort is what is going to drive this movement initially. So if we tell someone they have to be three years regenerative before we take their beef, we've ultimately just killed that market. So the onerous is on us. And one of the things that we've been really excited about is to bear the financial burden of helping these producers transition and know that we're going to cover all of those upfront costs and we're going to buy those beef, uh, you know, those bison, those lamb, those hogs, all of those different, uh, you know, animals simply by getting someone into the program and helping them move further and further down the chain. Now, some of the incentives that we've put in place is, is that we will pay more in year three, four, five, as you know, a hundred percent of their land becomes regenerative. But you know, if you can commit 10 to 15% of your land right out of the gate to being regenerative, we're going to work with you and we're going to put you on a path to, you know, to being a fully regenerative, uh, you know, rancher or farmer. Awesome. Can you tell me a little bit about just like what the process looks like in terms of converting a ranch to regenerative? Because I know this is kind of like a, that you have like these, like, I mean, everything builds on itself, right? So you have like these like layers essentially that the system's feeding into itself. Is there, is it something where they can say like, I'm going to start with 10% of my land and convert that fully to regenerative? Or is it something like I need to get my entire land this level or this layer in place before I move on to the second layer, that sort of thing? No, no. It, you know, it can really begin with just a small section of land. And if we use beef as kind of the, you know, the, the, the example of this one is, you know, I'm going to take, I'm going to take 10% of my herd and now I'm going to holistically manage them. We're going to do planned grazing throughout my, my piece of property. And, you know, th- that's going to be a start. And, and the nice thing about that is, is the economic burden doesn't fall solely on what that rancher is doing in regenerative. If he's got a commodity cash crop, you know, he can still sell that off to auction and, and make some money. But we're going to say, let's take 10% and let's really understand how your land works with regenerative. You know, let's really focus on, you know, understanding the data, getting baselines, getting soil samples and water infiltration tests, and really starting to create a plan that, you know, year one is 10%, maybe year two is 30%, maybe year three, you know, is is 50%. But we ultimately want to be moving our producers down the road of being 100% regenerative, but that doesn't happen overnight. And, And that's really, I think, what a lot of producers are afraid of is this Oh, for, for me to be accepted in this, like organic, I have to do 100% overnight. And that's a scary proposition for someone who, as you pointed out, Zach, might only be making 15% gross margin on all of their efforts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. And I think that kind of, that highlights the the areas that are sort of, as, as, as grand as it so, kind of sometimes seems, that they're set up to make a transition there to have a ranch in place. That's their business. That's their lifestyle you know, they're actually quite a bit further along than say, trying to convert some land that's been decertified into like ranch land or something like that, which kind of like brings me to my next question. I think one thing that I talked to Alan Savory a fair bit about was just what he saw within the potential of turning unusable land into usable land through regenerative agriculture. And he had, you know, a lot of his, his programs were looked at places like they went over into like desert areas in Africa and actually converted them into like usable ranch land and stuff like that. So is that something that is either in your current setup or something that is 
what you're that you're going to maybe implement down the road is how do we actually open up the available land for something like this? So the mission of regenerative pastures is to help convert 20% of the 900 million agronomic acres in the U.S. to regenerative in the next five years. A large chunk of that is what we would consider that BLM land, especially in kind of the Western states. And so much of that has already been desertified. I mean, if you look at a topographical map or even just a satellite image of the United States, you can see how dry that whole Western portion is. We've seen what's happened with the Colorado River and, and, you know, states like Arizona and, you know, New Mexico and actually not New Mexico, but like California, Nevada are, are dry. And, it, and it's funny, like how many millions of people are moving a year to like Phoenix or Las mm-hmm. Vegas? I'm like, there's no water there. Like, yeah. are, are you guys are you guys batshit crazy? <laughs> um, but if, if we really follow the tenets of regenerative, of holistic management, there is a profound opportunity to reverse that desertification in some of those areas. Um, some of them. It might take decades, if not more, but there are certain areas, you know, like Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, um, you know, uh, New Mexico that really have a unique opportunity just by increasing the amount of, of animals on those are- on those, you know, on that land and then moving them through in a holistic management really gives us that amazing opportunity to to fix some of these issues. Um, but unfortunately, we are headed in the wrong direction, and that's building more houses you know, paving more, you know, throwing down more concrete, all of these things that increase, um, you know, or rapidly accelerate climate change, we have to be going in the other direction. It's more animals, less building, you know, it's, that's, we are unfortunately headed in the wrong direction. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. 